Has that actually happened to you or one of your co-stars where you'll be doing a scene and then suddenly er, like they're hungry and you hear a, a gurgle or no? It just happened to me just now. Oh. <laughs> Fade in. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night. Action! Hello everyone and welcome to Restaurant Fiction where we record in sunshiny Los Angeles right on Pacific Coast Highway. Obviously we have the ocean in back of me anyway. This is Restaurant Fiction once again. My name is Manus Rose where we explore the fictional restaurants, bars and clubs in TV and film. Today's episode is none other than amazing actor and improv comedian Mark Evan Jackson. You know him from Lessons in Chemistry. You know him him from The Good Place. He specialized in The Bad Place. You know him from a slew of other films and TV projects. He's came on to break down Lessons in Chemistry, uh, Supper, uh, excuse me, Supper at Six, and just explore. And we just are going to do a deep dive of how awesome and amazing Mark Evan Jackson is in general. Enjoy. All right. Mark, listeners, audience out there we dined at supper at six you see this is a cooking show that serves obviously food to where you don't just wing it the food the r d process is not about just winging it and feeling it no the tlc that goes into this food you can pretty much write a chemistry phd thesis on you know Cooking shows that we are brought up with around this time of Supper at Six are like, say, the Julia Child, you know, where she made French cuisine a little more comfortable uh, for Americans. There was also the Joy of Cooking, which kind of was like a textbook 101 to release any kind of fears you have with the kitchen. With Supper at Six, it's very much more empowering. It's empowering and it's saying, hey, not just cooking is cool, but you're cool. So live your original cool life. It's almost like a hoorah, but intrinsically, not just extrinsically. But, you know, even if Supper at Six goes off the air. There's always going to be a few different dishes that linger. Uh, number one, let's break it down, is the lasagna. The lasagna, you know, it's not just meat, cheese, and noodles. I mean, the ricotta bachamel is ungodly, uh, uh, heavenly, and just from another world. I mean... In a way, what it does is it makes wearing sweatpants at a Michelin star restaurant acceptable. Like, like really, that is the feel you get. The chicken pot pie is the Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa of pot pies, of any kind of savory pie, because you feel beyond the flaky crust that every single morsel of the pea, the carrot, the chicken chunk was carefully placed and well-balanced. Then there's the... Oyster Zot, which we actually really admired because Oysters Rockefeller just seems snooty. It seems like I'm going to, we're going to an old man's steakhouse and Oyster Zot is adventurous. It's light. It's like, I can, I can eat this. I can get behind this dish. And finally is the, um, almost the school lunchbox type uh, chocolate and peanut butter brownies. You know, you think that these two flavors should be separated, but no, it is world peace in a dish. And it's like if if a brownie could exemplify, I wish, world, not just U.S. politics, but world politics, I mean, this does because both of these flavors just get along swimmingly. You know, Emeril Lagasse, he pretty much helped start the Food Network and he did... Uh, bam, he went off the cuff and went bam to add to food. You know, Supper at Six doesn't really need any of that pizzazz to really 
add that umami, that uh, je ne sais quoi, if you will. I think I'm mispronouncing that word. You know, so is eating any of the food or the experience of supper at six, is it, say, sinful or heavenly? You know, are you going to go to the good place or the bad place? Well, personally, for Restaurant Fiction, we just say enjoy the ride and then tomorrow eat a salad and go for a good erg. So we are talking to actor, comedian, amazing person, Mark Evan Jackson, who had a hand in Lessons in Chemistry. He played Dr. Mason in Lessons in Chemistry. Mark, what did you think of that review? The floor is yours. What is your opinion on that? I think you're asking an awful lot of a, of a brownie to, uh, to solve world peace, but I, um, I think that the creators of uh, Lessons in Chemistry would love to know that anybody has spent this much time thinking about the ins and outs of the food presented in the show. Um, I do. I love the presentation of Elizabeth Zott as a chemist doing this. It's, um, as you say, it's very, it's got a little bit of Julia Child in it. Um, it's got a little bit of hidden figures. This was set in a time where, uh, you know, women had to find their voice in society. They, they, you know, were often housewives and, and, uh, thought of secondarily. And so it's an empowering story that I think, um, the food is really a vehicle for. And I do love that she's a chemist because I, um, I think a lot of love goes into it, but also it's, it's a formulaic thing. She, um, Elizabeth Bree's character, Elizabeth Zott doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, she's not beholden to French history or cooking history or, you know, how her mother did it or whatever. She's going to find the best way, the best temperature, the best duration to cook a certain thing. And it's very, it's a formula. It's, it's a recipe. It's a, it's a, an experiment. Obviously your character, Dr. Mason is not heavily involved in the food scenes. And we'll get to your, your, your characters involved in very important scenes, but not say food scenes, but still what foods do you envision Dr. Mason loving and eating? <laughs> uh, I've thought about this, not at all. Um, so, uh, but because he's an athlete, because he's a rower, I would think that he would have a pretty substantial carbohydrate need. Um, so I could see him, you know, eating pasta the night before an early morning row or that sort of thing. Um, he seems fairly East coasty. I bet he loves a chowder. Um, yeah, I, uh, that's not something that I would have given much thought to. But what kind of thought, you know, cause your character is an OBGYN and, you know, I mean, <laughs> but anyway, you know, what, what kind of say research or even story in your own mind did you bring to your character? Oh, um, is none a bad answer? Um, uh, I not, I don't like, I wouldn't have researched being an OBGYN. I think as an actor, you look for clues in the script. You look for, uh, the hints that the writers have given you about your point of view. And, and then it's up to you to decide what kind of day that person's having, where they were just before that moment that the, that we're choosing to televise. Um, what they're looking for or afraid of after that moment. Um, those are the those are the little bits of sauce that an actor gets to bring to a role. Um, but yes, I did not uh, I did not go to medical school to uh, to play. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, and I don't think yeah, like say the don't think uh, Brie went, went, got her PhD from MIT or I mean I didn't ask her. It's maybe. possible <laughs> Brie is Brie is a different brand of actor than I am. Yeah, she's uh, she's the real thing. One of your most your character's most pivotal scenes uh, with Elizabeth is pretty much a scene where you come in to do a house call and you pretty much say for her, "Hey, uh, I got an extra spot to erg to be on my erg team," and basically you're telling her, "Hey, uh, do some self love, do some self care, some self love for yourself, even if yes, you have the stresses of life." weighing down astronomically on on your soul but still you have stuff like what is in your own life what is your erg what is your <laughs> get out your self-love yourself um i mean erging is uh i do row uh long before i was had this role i i had a rowing machine at home and would would work out on that um i should talk about learning to row for this show yeah please that yeah that was uh um no one in the world appreciates how difficult rowing is I'm going to say that again. No one in the world, if I were good at rowing, I'd wear a t-shirt every day saying, ask me how hard rowing is. Um, 
it is so difficult. I've, I'm a boat person. I'm a water person. My wife and I used to belong to a club with sliding seat, overlapping, sculling oars, but in a proper boat, in a white hull. When you get in a shell, a boat that's as wide as your hips and five inches off the water, you can fall in right now. It is so hard and it's all about balance. And um, I was very cocky about it. I thought when, the, when they called and said, production uh, approved you for four lessons with some Olympian down in Long Beach, I was like, be surprised if it takes me four, but that sounds cool. And the 30 seconds in the boat, I was like, I'm going to need a lot more lessons than, than four lessons. So, I mean, that just adds to your, your character. I mean, now, was that a mutual deci decision be behind yourself and creative? Like, hey, this is going to just step it up, that we're not just going to put in green screen of, of erging for all of our talent. No, no, you're actually going to get in the boat, you're actually going to do the work. I think that was a decision made by the creative powers that be long ago, and I think it's a good one, but it's an expensive one. It's one that involved weeks and weeks of lessons for Bree and for Lewis and for me. And then on the shoot day, it involves uh, chase boats and, you know, rescue swimmers on, on jet skis and getting, they had to source um, 1950s, 1960s wooden rowing shells when they when the show got announced, somebody from the Long Beach Rowing Center drove up to Seattle to go put one on a trailer, and I think they got one off the wall of a TGI Fridays, in fact, because um, it was like era appropriate, and they're hard to find these days because they're made of wood and are very, very precarious. If you, when you get in these boats, this is one of the first indications of how difficult this is. There's like they say, there's only one place on the boat that you can step; otherwise, you'll put your foot through the hull and the boat will sink. Yeah, they're made of nothing. They're super light. Yeah. It's, nobody knows how hard drawing is. All right, bringing it back to supper at six. Which food would you like to cook and eat from supper at six? And even the, any, any food featured in Lessons in Chemistry? Um, you mentioned the lasagna and that looked amazing to me. Um, although I would say, I think that, um, Mad's lunches that uh, that Bree sent her her child sent her daughter to school with uh, you know gourmet sandwiches and such, and of course kids being kids she traded it away immediately. But um, those lunches look spectacular to me. Those look like the exact type of thing that you'd want to you know have on the road or be able to take to work. I certainly did not have those school lunches growing up. Pizza and fries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. What is your dream cooking show where you're the host? So say, oh wow, yeah. So say like a studio or a network is like, Mark, we love you, we love your work, but we want you to be the host of a of a cooking show. But you have full creative control. Any budget, floor is yours. Uh, I love this idea so much. I just started following a Japanese man on Instagram who makes. He's got these kits, these aluminum camping kits. And um, it's like campaign furniture. And he opens this box and out come cutting boards and uh, little, a little stove and tea sets and coffee sets and um, oil lamps and stuff. And it's the most romantic thing in the world. I'll show you a link before I leave. And, uh, and so my cooking show would be uh, you hike up a hill to a, a scenic overlook and, uh, and then prepare things like tiny luxuries prepared in the wild uh, with a fantastic vista. So this could be, I mean, my thing would be, uh, I wish my whole life were a lobster bake. Like I, I would love to just boil lobsters and corn and potatoes and cook, you know, snails and mussels and, uh, steamer clams and then finish it off with s'mores. That's my restaurant. It's a camping. You are up a mountain and you are doing a lobster bake and there are s'mores. With some ice cold suds. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, that sounds, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. A little I mean, brown liquor to finish it off. Can I bring the sausage? Can we throw in some sausage in the, By in the bake? Of course. Of course. And what about some craw crawfish? I'm in. Nice. Absolutely. Yeah. More is more. I love that. I love that. You had, you played a role in the good place. You actually played a role, excuse me, in the bad place from the show, the good place. Correct. Speaking of fictitious and you're going off of fictitious dining experiences. How would you design a dining experience that embodies the bad place? Oh, gosh. 
Well, that gets filthy immediately. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, at best, it starts with acids and uh, shards of glass, um, and then immediately becomes full diarrhea. Um, yeah, uh, nobody wants to hear me answer that question. Fine. What about this one? When viewers saw you in the bad place, uh, it you know there was a lot of like they didn't see it say but heard it like the torture and you know and your the torture and just evil stuff. Well, in terms of food, and you can speak now as an adult or when you were a child, what food or dish was considered torturous to you to where <laughs> you were in the bad place? Um, oh wow, that's a great question. Um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and um, we still bewilderingly drank milk, like with meals, like filled a glass with milk and drank it, uh, which now seems disgusting uh, to me. Um, and my parents, uh, my father grew up during the Depression, so my torture, uh, the thing that was the most punitive was like you'd eat, you'd have dinner, and maybe having had half of your milk, um, they'd be like, finish that milk. And, but this time it's warm, it's room temperature. And that is gross. And I would be made to finish my milk and uh, not waste it. And that was arduous. Like that was the grossest. Yeah. I may have to leave to briefly vomit. <laughs> Sorry for triggering a memory. Sorry <laughs> for triggering a memory. Yeah. <laughs> I'll work through it. <laughs> Right. And, you know, one of the cool things about or the funny things, there was many funny things, but one of the funny things was all of the puns mm -hmm. that were used in all of the fictitious restaurants, you know, especially the frozen yogurt. Now, in reality, there are puns for restaurants all over, especially Vietnamese restaurants. Like there's pho king, you know, there's pho nominal, et cetera, et cetera. What, what about a pun makes a restaurant more enticing? So if you're driving, you're like, that's funny. You're, you're with your wife. That's funny. Let's just eat there. Yeah. I'm the opposite. Uh, I hate puns so much. Um, I, <laughs> they make me angry. And it's only, I think they only worked in the good place because Megan Amram, the primary writer of the puns of Footlogger and Biscotti Pippin and Pump Up the Clam and A Little Bit Chowder Now and all of them. Um, she just was so relentless <laughs> with the puns and such a deep well. Like she took something that I think is pedestrian and, and like low and just made it exquisite. Like she, she perfected the restaurant pun kind of thing. Um, when I see a hair salon called like sheer madness or whatever, like everything in me wants to burn that place to the ground. Um, but uh, yeah, Megan Amram in particular made those puns really good. Um, I shot a movie in Vietnam and uh, uh, pho for breakfast is how you do it. Like uh, my wife and I were in Vietnam for a few weeks, um, uh, in like 2016, I think, um, on this film. And uh, they eat pho for breakfast. And at first it was like, oh, I don't know if I want like noodle soup for breakfast. And then you realize like, oh, this is great. Like this is a perfect, it's light. It's a perfect balance. It's a little bit of carb, a little bit of protein. And um, when we got back to Los Angeles, we were like, a few days later, we were like, what time's that foot place open? Like if they're open at 1030, I might go there for breakfast kind of thing. Um, I recommend pho for breakfast. Um, Mark is speaking the gospel, everyone. Mm -hmm. So yes. You heard. You heard, right. I mean, uh, we were in Hanoi, mm -hmm. my wife and I, Yes, pho for breakfast is no joke. Now, did you have the the Chinese donuts with the pho? They they sometimes put some. No. It's almost like a chu uh, chi, uh Chinese Vietnamese fusion, oh. or it's more of the Chinese influence of Vietnamese food, and they put these Chinese donuts in the pho, in the beef pho. No, yeah. I have to go back. No, I don't think I did. Oh yeah, and also. Uh, really quick, if you want pho in the morning, you do have to take a trek. Yes, right now we're in Los Angeles, but you do have to take a 45-minute trek to Little Saigon in Orange County. Oh, okay. Yeah. And also, you want to go where all the gangsters go. I'm just saying in the morning oh. with all of their, you know, let's just say crew, if you will. But you know it's going to be good. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'll check it out. <laughs> all right. So more, a little bit more of... um well, just food in general, you know, you mentioned 
uh, this, you know, this uh, movie you shot, you mentioned, you know, um, King Kong or the Skull Island. Mm -hmm. Let's even throw in Brooklyn Nine-Nine and even let's throw in all the other shows and films you remember. Which one had the best food? The actual... Oh, for for us? The, yeah, like, the catering and craft service? Yeah. Um, that's going to be tough. I uh, The... They're all very good. Mm -hmm. the, we are treated very nicely. Um, the craft service table at uh, on any given proper show is like a free convenience store that you can eat from at all times. Um, I think my favorite of those was The Good Place because Kristen Bell is, um, is a, you know, health conscious and a vegetarian. And so a lot of the snacks weren't, um, I mean, we still had nerds ropes and stuff, but a lot of it was like healthier, um, good for you stuff. Uh, like I think that our, um, I have a weird thing about, uh, I definitely have on set things that I eat that I would never eat in real life. And for me, it's like gummy stuff. I like those Welch's uh, gummy bears and the Haribo. And um, uh, yeah, I like, for some reason, that texture on set. I mostly eat uh, in the morning so that my stomach doesn't growl on camera. Um, but uh, but yeah, I uh, Kristen Bell's sets have a very good craft service. I mean, all of it's amazing. It just really quick. I mean, has that actually happened to you or one of your co-stars where you'll be doing a scene and then suddenly er, like they're hungry and you hear a, a gurgle or no, it just happened to me just now. Oh, <laughs> I'll, I'll find it. Um, but, uh, for sure. Like, yeah. I mean, when you're, you know, when you've got Sennheiser four sixteens and stuff, like it's going to pick it up and you were wearing microphones in our clothing. Like, yeah, it's going to get you a good, like <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You help a lot of um, the improv community, especially in Detroit and all that now, to an up-and-coming improv actor. Um, it, instead of coming up to you and saying, hey, Mark, what advice would you give me? What advice would you tell an emerging up-and-comer to ignore? <laughs> um, I think the advice I would recommend ignoring is to be versatile. Like, I think that... Um, versatility can come later. I, I think that you should find what you do, what your comedic voice is, who you are as a performer and distill that rather than go, and I should learn to juggle and I should ride a unicycle and I should learn to row and uh, do a bunch of accents. Um, I recommend that, uh, that you find your comedic voice. What, what makes, what's the way that you would do the scene that nobody else can or would because they just aren't you. Um, distill who you are as a performer and uh and perfect that and then begin to spiral outward how did you find your voice i found my voice um through improv i've never studied acting i've never taken an acting class i found improv accidentally in the mid 90s in grand rapids michigan some friends of mine from college um, were putting together a short form improv troupe to play games kind of like whose line is it anyway and i grew up playing a lot of music so they asked my college roommate to come play piano for them and he said i don't want to do that you go do that and i went to the first rehearsal to go be the accompanist for river city improv and saw what they were doing and was like holy cow uh we need to find somebody else to come play the piano because i want to learn to do what you're doing and do it for the rest of my life like it was a gigantic aha moment for me and um and then just by doing it and doing it and doing it like um Improv is the greatest and everyone should take an improv class, whether you have any hope of ever being a performer or not. Like it's just, it's such a world opening, fear erasing, empathy driving skill set. Um, that's why my wife and I 12 years ago launched the Detroit Creativity Project, a 501c3 nonprofit to teach improv free of charge in Detroit middle and high schools. Cause it's the best thing for everybody. Like it's such a collaborative, um, it, it gives you a sense of belonging. You, you learn teamwork and listening and respect, and you learn that you're improvising at every moment. We're improvising now. There's no script for what we're doing now. There's no script for how anybody goes through their day. Um, so for me as an actor, like it was just doing it and doing it and doing it and finding what I found funny, what tickled me and, and you know, the delivery of a line or um, the status of a character, choices like that. Um, it's improv a hundred percent that that is how I found my comedic voice. And either say with 
with the roles you choose or just as a fan, as a watcher, yeah, what what types of stories stick with you? Uh, my stomach just growled and I missed it. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I've been very fortunate. Like I've, I've uh, been able to work a lot. So I am now able to um, be a little bit choosy when it comes to roles. There are definitely things that it's like, I don't like taking a role that I read and think like, well, anybody could do this. Like I like seeing a, a role and it's like, oh, this is meant for me. Like this is a thing that I can really sink my teeth into and, and make mine kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, early in your career, you take jobs, you take the, the whatever jobs you're given. Um, but yeah, the things I like, um, I like playing, I like saying the bold untruth. I like, I like playing characters who are so wrong, like a Sean from The Good Place. Like, um, that's, that's a fun role to play because he's wrong all the time. He is the worst. And um, to, to know that the rest of the characters and story around you is going to correct you, um, that's a dumb guy with a big ego that I love to be. What failure of yours had actually, has actually turned out to be a success or an ultimate success? So say at the time you were really pissed like that this didn't happen or this didn't go well, but now looking back, it's like, no, it needed to happen because it opened so many doors. And it's like, yeah. yeah. Brooklyn Nine-Nine is that way uh, for me. I tested for the role of Charles Boyle. I tested for Joe Latrulio's role. It came down to him and me, and we did chemistry reads with Stephanie Beatrice because they, they had sort of a will they, won't they in the first season and uh, did chemistry reads with, uh, with Andy Samberg, uh, improvised with Andy to see what that would be like. And um, I wasn't pissed about not getting it. Um, it came down to the two of us, and... The role was written the way Joe is, Joe played it. Um, he, you know, Boyle was a uh, kind of a schlub, and I can't be a schlub. Like I approach everything as me, which is uh, Niles Crane C three PO. Um, you know, uh, and I, I, so I went about it that way. But I improvised a lot, and they kept bringing me back because they're like, he's totally wrong for this, but it's very fun and very weird. And so it came down to the two of us and Joe, I had known a little bit before then, and we were in a green room, you know, for our final tests and both, you know, we shook hands and hugged and we're like, however this goes, it goes. And I went and I killed in my final audition and got in the car and called my manager and said like, I did look, I did everything I wanted to do. If, I, if we get this great, if we don't, I like no harm, no foul. Joe's going to be great at it. Um, but you know, obviously it's a network television job. It was a job that I wanted. And so you do leave it going like, you know, I, like I feel fine. I, I did everything I wanted to do. It was, he, he's doing the, it as written, uh, you know, and he's improvising as well, but he's closer to the character and, uh, that makes a lot of sense. But like, it does hurt your heart where you're like, Oh, like so close to this really cool show, Andy Samberg and Andre Brower and Terry Crews, like what an amazing show. And, uh, that opened so many doors because the, you know, the producers of that were the producers of Parks and Rec. And so a couple of weeks later, my phone rang and my agents were like, um, they want you for Parks and Rec next week. And I was like, I did an audition for Parks and Rec recently. And they're like, I don't know. And, uh, they gave me a role on Parks and Rec of, uh, uh, Trevor Nelson, the law, the lawyer from Four Dips, Winchers, Grit, Peppa Pakota, Vorp, and Eckstein. And I played that role for the next however many years, whenever they needed an attorney. Um, the directors of the pilot of Brooklyn Nine-Nine are Phil Lord and Chris Miller. So I got 22 Jump Street from that. Um, and then, of course, a couple of months later, I got an email saying they'd like to offer the role of Dr. Kevin Cosner, husband to Captain Raymond Holt. And I can remember sitting at my desk in my office and screaming like, I called for my wife. I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. Like, like it opened so many doors. Um, and I was bummed, you know, like I, I really wanted to do it. And it turned out I, I did like it, it came around in a different and better for me way. Mark, what question are we not asking? Why should everyone take an improv class? I'm glad you asked. Uh, <laughs> it's good for everybody. No jokes. It's so much fun. You'll make the best friends of your life. Uh, when you learn to be vulnerable in front of other people, you realize it's not that scary. And um, 
Look up your local improv classes and go take one. Mark, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are welcome back anytime. Obviously, you're welcome back in studio, but if you just want to org, or excuse me, erg and row a little bit, why I get my surfboard, that is, well, obviously, the ocean's right, be right behind me, so let's hit it, let's kick it. And anyway, thank you for watching us. Thank you for listening to us. You want to know all things Mark Evan Jackson. He's out there. Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Lessons in Chemistry, The Good Place to Name. Just That's just the tip of the iceberg of all the creative projects he does or has done. Look for him in future projects. My name is Monis Rose. You found us wherever you watch your podcast, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And as always, keep it real, keep it fresh, and keep it on the flip side.